All right. So welcome everyone to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives Anniversary Speaker Series. My name is Stacey Krim, and I'm the Curator of Manuscripts and Special Collections in University Archives. And today I have the honor of introducing and speaking to our guests today. Tara T. Green is Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she teaches literature and Black women's studies courses. She holds degrees in English, and her areas of specialty include Black parent-child relationships, Black leadership, activism, and liberation. Inspired by her Southern upbringing, Dr. Green is a lover of storytelling. At UNCG, she works with librarians to expand the archival presence of the local Black community, including interviews with Black Lives Matter protesters and organizers for the Triad Black Lives Matter collection. She is the author or editor of six books. Her book, A Fatherless Child, Autobiographical Perspectives of African-American Men, received the 2011 Outstanding Scholarship in Africana Studies Award from the National Council for Black Studies. In 2018, she published Reimagining the Middle Passage, Black Resistance in Literature, Television, and Song. She has edited two books, From the Plantation to the Prison, African American Confinement Literature and Presenting Oprah Winfrey, Her Films, and African American Literature. Dr. Green's most recent books, See Me Naked, Black Women Defining Pleasure During the Interwar Era, published by Rutgers University Press, and Love, Activism, and the Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson, published by Bloomsbury look specifically at how Black women of the late 19th and early 20th century navigated the politics of respectability to live on their own terms. Moving beyond her research, she has received numerous service and educators award. Dr. Green was reared in the suburbs of New Orleans. Thank you for speaking with us today, Dr. Green. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. So we're gonna cover a lot of topics today, hopefully. And uh, I'd like to get us started a bit about you as an educator. So I was wondering if you could speak to us about what inspired you to become an educator and what motivates you as an educator. Well, I see education and research as being intertwined. When I was a student at Dillard University, which is a, a liberal arts institution and in historically black, University in New Orleans, I was um, accepted into a program that was hosted by Duke University. And that program was a pre-doctoral program to prepare students at HBCUs for careers in education. In order for me to be a part of that, of course, is I had to have a research project. And so we were able to intern with our professors and a, and a mentor really at the institution. And so I have never thought about teaching as separate from research. Even when I began teaching at Southern University in 2000, I prepared students to read papers at the graduate student conference at my, my graduate school alma mater, LSU. So um, those two are intertwined for me. Um, are there any shout outs you'd like to give to a particularly influential educator that you had? Oh goodness, there were so many. The English professors at Dillard University were just so wonderful. The one that invited me to become an English major, Dr. Gail Duskin, and the person who was chair of the English department that I worked for for four years, um, Sylvia um, Bryant, who was also my advisor for the research program that I was involved with as well. And then there were folks in graduate school, certainly John Lowe, who's still teaching at the, um, he's now at the University of Georgia uh, in Athens. He was my dissertation advisor. 
And so he was, was, he always had my back and, and um, for a black woman going through a graduate program, it's always important to have that kind of support. Mm -hmm. And now uh, you're in a position of being that support for many of your students. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, for many undergraduate Black students, enrolling in African American and African diaspora studies courses is the first time they may have ever known what it's like to have their voice, voices centered and have their experiences really legitimized in an academic way. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak about what it's like working with those students and the process of working with those students. Well, our student body, is quite diverse. So I want to make sure that we understand that Black students, that could mean anything. Some of them could be first generation. Some of them could be the, the grandchildren of folks who graduated from college. Some of them um, have parents that are from other countries or maybe one parent who's from another country. And so then education means something quite different from them because their parents came to the U.S. specifically so that their children, even if they didn't have children at the time, would have a better life. And that tends to be something shared, actually, I think, across the diaspora because my parents wanted the same for me. That's why they're no longer in the rural areas that they were born and raised in. So that process, it depends on <clears throat> the student. Um, and, and I've certainly seen students over the course of uh, a 22 year career change over the years because we've, we've gone from one generation to the next and to another. And so um, it depends on what the students needs are, what the students wants are. Some mm -hmm. students want to know more. Some students just want to know enough so that they can get their degree and move on to a job. Some students want to go to graduate school. Some students ask, can I have more readings? Will you work with me in an independent student, um, an independent study course? And so um, I, when I am working on my syllabi, I try to think about the diversity of students and the goals that I would like to see them reach by the end of the semester. And I certainly do my best to work with students so that they can reach those goals and feel that they've learned something when they leave that they didn't know when they came in. That's wonderful. Um, of the many courses you've taught, you've really pioneered a Black Lives Matter course. And you uh, happened to be teaching it during the uh, protest about George Floyd's murder. I was wondering if you could talk about the motivation and development of that course and what it was like teaching it during that time. Well, that was actually my third time teaching it. And, and so um, again, moving from the millennial generation to the generation that we have now and seeing interest in protesting and organizing, uh, seeing those differences in how students were reacting. Trayvon Martin's murder was not recorded. So we didn't see what happened and we know that the person accused of that murder did not um, was exonerated was found not guilty so then to move up several years later and to have a recording of a person's murder to uh, which was George Floyd but also to have the recording of Ahmaud Arbery um, we didn't have a recording of what happened to Breonna Taylor, but we know that um, there was someone there who gave testimony of what occurred. And so the anger that was involved in these high profile murders was something that um, we all witnessed and took part in whether you wanted to or not. 
And so I under I had some understanding of teaching civil rights when I first started teaching Black Lives um, Matter course. And then once this occurred, that meant that I was not only building on those skills, but also having an awareness of the moment because there were, were protests that were continuing to happen, not just during the summer, but some things that were happening in August as well. And students really wanted to talk. So many of them had been to protests, not all of them that took my course that semester, but they all had an opinion. They all um, felt afraid. Um, and this is particular to black students. I also want to make sure that, that um, I emphasize the fact that the course had, um, it was diverse so that it wasn't just black students who were in the course, but um, they all wanted to, I think, have language for what they were feeling and for what they had seen and for what they had experienced. And so that's what a course does. That happened to be the most emotional course, I think, that I have taught because there were I was also dealing with um, a sense of hopelessness that students had, um, a sense that things had not changed <clears throat> since their grandparents' era. And so it was a lot to deal with, but um, I think together we made it through that. And I had hoped to empower students by giving them a voice with the oral projects that we did. Wonderful. And um, let's talk a bit about those that oral history project. Um, and let's begin by talking about your background as a storyteller, since that's so critical also to research in oral histories. Um, can you talk, tell us a bit about your background as a storyteller? Well, you know, as, as many Southerners do, we are in a storytelling culture, which is certainly especially true of people of African descent. <clears throat> um, and so growing up, my understanding of living in a rural area, living through Jim Crow in that rural area in the Deep South, for my mother, it was Louisiana, I would understand that through the stories that they told and they being my mother at times and an uncle of mine um, who was her older brother. My father did not tell his story. So I learned from silence also. Um, so the importance of that, I strongly believe is why I went into graduate school, well, first of all, to an HBCU, first of all. Um, secondly, deciding to be an English major because I just loved reading fiction. And thirdly, then to pursue a PhD. When I went to college, as, as many people have had this experience, I went to college thinking that I was gonna to go to law school. But when I found out that there was a such thing as, as doing research and um, that I could share that research in some ways in the classroom, I was hooked. So that was what drove me to become a professor. So that storytelling is, I am rooted in it and it is rooted in me. I strongly believe that the voices of Black people um, is a way of reclaiming um, the kinds of silences that were forced upon them. Silence can be used as a tool of power, but it can also be forced upon one um, so that their voices and their thoughts and their beliefs are not heard. 
And uh, so that was what I brought into the classroom that semester. Wonderful. Um, one of the ways you uh, have really contributed to um, dealing with the archival and historic record silences of Black people, especially in terms of local history, is your collaborations with university libraries on a few of projects. Uh, and of course, talking about the your students' involvement with the Black Lives Matter, uh, Triad Black Lives Matter collection we have here. Um, can you talk a bit about what was going on and how how you came to us during that time? Because we not only had the protests, but we were, it was also during COVID. Um, and you were you were down on the streets collecting stories yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I had gone to a silent protest. So, so again, there can be power in silence when people choose that method. And I previously had driven down Elm Street and saw all of the art that was um, being put up. I mean, it, this was all in process. So, um, you know, usually when I show up, people have passed on um, and, and I'm talking about things a hundred years after they've happened, but this was in process and it felt important to me because as you all know from the email that I sent to you and David, I, I said, is anybody doing anything or having any conversations about this art? Because I was afraid things were gonna be taken and thrown in the trash and that just made me wanna pull my hair out. But the art that I saw was expressive in such a way that it just, it gripped me. And that was the pain of, of thinking that that art would be lost. That meant that the moments would be lost, but somebody put the art up. Who were those people? And were they working together? So I had all of these questions as I, I would have as a scholar and decided to email you all. I think it was that, that Sunday evening and, and we had a meeting to talk about how we were, what our goals would be. So, um, so it really came out of a feeling that there are voices that complement and supplement the artistic stories that we see as we drive down this street. There's more to be said and how can we preserve that? Mm -hmm. And I do wanna personally thank you, Dr. Green. Your, your uh, work with us has contributed to um, not only the digital donations, which you personally donated, but also physical donations that have been used in several courses already for our students. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, your, your students in the Black Lives Matter uh, class had a project that was contributed to the collection as well. Can you speak a bit about that? Well, certainly. So we have the course where we are studying writings and um, visual materials. Again, that was my third time teaching the course. So there was more material that was available. When I first started teaching, there, there were no, no um, memoirs by the, the, um, the founders or, or any of that. And so more material was available and people were continuously writing because they were responding to the protests. And so there was a growing archive, if you will, of material that the students had, again, to give them language. But of course they understood at the beginning of the course because it was in the syllabus that they were going to participate in collecting by doing either a creative project themselves as one or two students did or conducting an oral interview with someone who was part of the protest. And those are part of the collection. Yes, um, and our students 
love uh, hearing the hearing the experiences of other students uh, in the especially in historic research. So we're really excited to have those as part of the collection. Mm -hmm. Another project we are we are working on together, um, and I do want to give a shout out to David Gwen, our digitization coordinator, who is the uh, the mysterious David that that Dr. Green mentioned, <laughs> who uh, has has been part has been the my better half on the, this team in university libraries. Um, we're also working with St. James Presbyterian Church right now, which is a historically Black church that was founded in 1867, which you were instrumental in connecting us to work with them and their social justice ministry. Can you speak a bit about the significance of Black churches to the Black community, especially locally? Mm -hmm. Well, Greensboro is known for its long activist um, history. And some of that history can be traced specifically to churches. I just am so impressed when a church, and I come out of Black church culture, um, when a church it, it celebrates a 100 year anniversary. That's amazing to me because churches do not get um, state funding. So, so when we talk about a university is over a hundred years old, well, universities are set up to be over a hundred years old and, and, and they have funding and they're part of um, systems. If, if they're um, state institutions, they're probably part of a system. Um, and, and, and people, thousands of people contribute to that. But with a church, you don't have you probably don't have thousands of people contributing to it. You have people over generations who think that it is important and they do their best to have an independently, as much as it is independently run organization because these people want to see their children, their grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on have a space where they can um, have relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so um, I also know then if a church is over 100 years old, there's got to be some papers in file cabinets probably that will help us to understand who the people were and what were some of the things that they did and what contributions did they make um, from the church to the community around them? Because that's another mission of the church is to serve the community. And uh, one of the talents you have brought both to the St. James Project and Black Lives Matter Project is your, your talent with oral histories, which I, I imagine goes back to your storytelling um, background. Can you talk a bit about the importance of oral histories and research? Yeah, um, and, I, and I will add to that also journalism because, because I did um, minor in journalism when I was at Dillard University. So, um, you know, again, it just goes to me seeing the importance of, if coming out of a tradition where people were not allowed to know how to write because they were not allowed to know how to read. I mean, these, these are my ancestors because I am of the South. I, I was not, um, freedom is, is not part of my history as far as I know. And so either things can be passed down orally, knowledge can be passed down orally, or it's not passed down. And so there are names that we don't know. There are places that we don't know about and incidents that get lost, but for the preservation of voices. And so because I find that so important, we have the technology now in ways in which we didn't have it a hundred years ago. You know, technology has changed over the years. We, we have, um, people who were formerly enslaved who have told their stories, we have access to that. 
but we have even more access to the people who enslaved them and what they wrote about them. And those records that were kept by governments and, and on plantations. So these oral histories allow for us to counteract. Um, they become uh, tools of resistance. They become tools of protest. They are the I am kinds of testimonies that are missing from the archives too often that I want to see corrected. So we're gonna to touch uh, eventually on your two most recent publications, but before we, we get there, I wanted to ask you about um, the particulars of researching African-American history that you touched on it being um, a suppressed history of uh, you as a, a scholar are filling in, are, are working with the historic record to create the historic narrative that's been abandoned in the past. And I'm wondering if you um, can talk a bit about your process as a researcher in an archival setting. Well, it begins with the question. Um, so for me, with the Alice Dunbar Nelson book, Love, Activism, and the Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson, it began with a question that must have been in my mind when I first started reading her work at Dillard University. She was an alum of Straight College, which became, which merged with another institution to become Dillard University. And I had taught some of her earlier work, but I became very curious to know what happened to that woman and to find out that she had moved to Wilmington, Delaware, and she had left New Orleans. My question was, why did a woman who was a Creole woman leave New Orleans in a culture that she would have known very well to move to Wilmington, Delaware? And the answer is in the book. So, <laughs> so it's the research always has to begin with the question. What question are you trying to answer and of course that takes us into all of these other questions as well and um all of your research requires some degree of emotional labor in addition to the standard challenge of just doing research can you speak a bit about that well in order to feel like the work that I'm doing has value. If it doesn't have value to me first, then I can't expect that it will have value to anyone else. How can I sell it in a pitch to a um, publisher? How can I sell it in a pitch to a, a potential audience? It has to mean something to me. And so this is where people will find that I often write about gender in my work and it's not always about men. The first book, A Fatherless Child, comes out of discussions, by the way, again, going back to storytelling of Black men. Anytime I would say to a Black man, I am writing this book, they would tell me the story of their relationship with their own father, whether it was... Um, a relationship with a father that was present or a relationship with a father who was not present. So there may be a lack thereof. And that was how I understood that the book that I was writing was important. Um, but even going on to the last two books that are in conversation with one another, the See Me Naked title comes out of a reference to Alice Dunbar Nelson's diary that she writes about being naked in in water in public um, or not in public but um, it's part of a long conversation that I am having with myself and with people around me and it's a conversation that I 
enjoy having because there are so many other voices that I hear. I, I recently was saying to someone that the last book that I wrote, which essentially looks at the lives of five different women who did not know each other, that it was like having a long conversation with um, ancestral women, spirits, literally. Um, because by the time I finished those books, I would have lessons and understanding about what it means to be a Black woman in America. And so obviously that helps me to understand my own standing and my own challenges and triumphs as well. And what advice would you consider giving students who um, you, you have become their inspiration, they have found out they can do this sort of research for a living, um, and, but they haven't started yet. What advice would you give them? I always tell students to think about what inspires them. So if, if they're reading something and they get to the end of it and they feel good about it, that can be the topic for the paper. Um, and so we're not always involved in, in laborious work where we feel like we have to do something. But what is it that makes you happy? What is it that makes you feel good? And I always hope that everybody, students and, and everybody is, is able to find some inspiration. That's why I wrote the book about pleasure and defining what that is, that they find their own pleasure even in work as these Black women that I talk about did as well. So I wanna to turn to uh, your, your most recent books. You've had a busy year, 2022, sought two books by you published. And I am going to shamelessly turn to um, Love, Activism, and Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson because I'm reading it right now. So I get to ask you questions about it. Um, but so this is uh, for those of you who are monitoring chat, Patrick has put in links. We have an electronic copy in the library if you're part of the UNCG community that when we're done with the talk, you can immediately start reading just so you're aware. Um, and this is, uh, Dr. Green, your storytelling ability really comes through in this book because it is so engrossing while being simultaneous, simultaneously in a great academic work. Um, and what I'd like to do is give a bit of background of who Alice Van Bar is to Nelson is to the audience, but also um, you, this book centers a lot on identity how uh, Alice identified herself and how the world was identifying Alice at a time the world for, uh, at, during a time that the world for black Southern middle-class women was, was changing. Uh, can you talk about those? I know that's a big, that's a lot, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Alice Dunbar Nelson was born in New Orleans in 1875. She died in um, Philadelphia in 1935. During that period of time, she became a teacher. She graduated, as I mentioned before, from Straight College in New Orleans and received her training in teaching. And that is what she would do for as long as she could. She did that work in Brooklyn, New York. She did that work in Wilmington, Delaware at a school that is um, called Howard. Um, Howard School, it's, it's been since renamed, but um, the school is still there. She was also a suffragist. She was recording the first recording secretary of the National Association of Colored Women. So she was a pioneer in the Black women's club movement. She was a um, very heavily involved in politics, and that would be reflected at times in her fiction, but most certainly in her editorial. So she was also a journalist. This was a woman who wrote in every genre um, known to anybody. <laughs> 
She wrote uh, music lyrics. She was a member, uh, became an, an early honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, of which I too am a member. And she was involved with the Democratic and finally the Republican Party. So she went back and forth from Republican, Democrat to Republican because she wanted to hold people that she um, voted for and that she was um, in political relationship with accountable. And if they did not do what they promised to do, then she would leave and take some folks with her if she could. So she was also involved with the anti-lynching bill, the dire anti-lynching bill, um, which of course we know anti-lynching bill was not um, passed until very recently, the last couple of weeks. So she was just um, tireless in the work that she did to improve race relations and the position of women in the United States of America. How did people see her? They saw her as probably a um, certainly an outspoken woman, um, heterosexual woman. She was married three times to men, but what many people would not know is that she also had relationships with women. And so she was not heterosexual. She was a queer black woman at a particular time in society when being so was not considered to be respectable behavior. But when she died, she was regarded as one who not only fought for the rights of women and for black people, but who was um, regarded as being this beautiful, well-spoken woman that was just highly respected. That's, that's what one of the words that people used in, in several devotions to her um, that was printed in, that were printed in black newspapers at the time. Yeah, and so see me naked black women defining pleasure in the interwar era and Alice Dunbar Nelson are clearly very tied together mm -hmm. um, in terms of their themes. And um, what you have brought across in these works very well is the, uh, the struggle for Black women to have sovereignty over their own bodies and explore pleasures that did not have to be connected to the benefit of other people. And the um, the promotion of middle class respectability that was in some cases contrary to that. Can you speak a bit about what was happening to Black women's identities during that period? Well, I, it, that sort of parallels with the identity of the country because we are talking about the turn of the century. And so, for example, um, I talk about Yolanda Du Bois. She was born in 1900. Now, of course, her father was born in the late in in the the 1900s. So, I mean, in in the eight, 1800s, the the 19th century. So, um, and I also talk about Bombs Mabley of North Carolina, wonderful comedian. If you all don't know her, look up her work and the beautiful, um, beautifully talented Memphis Minnie. So, um, and Lena Horn. So all of these women had a connection to a time where women were to be buttoned up. I mean, if, you know, in terms of clothing, I always marvel at how in the world these women walked around in the summer with these clothes on from head to toe, from neck, neck to toe. Somehow they did, but it was the expectation of society not to show too much skin. And of course, that would change over a period by the time, certainly by the time we got to the 20s and certainly the 30s, a little bit more skin could be shown. This is the blues era, and then we're getting into the jazz era. And of course, that is um, the, um, the flapper girls. So we are talking then about the interwar era. Um, so their generations overlap and 
the question of who is the United States of America, particularly on this question of women, particularly as Black men return from um, fighting in World War I, along with, with everybody else who fought in World War I, um, what kind of rights should they have here compared to the kinds of rights and experiences that they may have felt that they had when they were um, in other parts of the world? So all of these questions are on the table. And women, particularly Black women who, whom I am focused on, are trying to figure out their place even though I would say that they knew what their place was, it was convincing other folks <laughs> that their place was not simply to be in the home because for people of the educated middle class working was for women was, you know, it was limited. Um, if you had children, you were expected to stay at home. So they knew what their place was. It was convincing other people that, um, to give them the freedom that they should have had, that was the kind of struggle that I capture in the work. And it really comes through. I was reading through the uh, Lena Horn section and your analysis of her autobiography um, and her coming to terms as a, um, a very visible uh, Black woman and having to deal with the two identities the public gave mm -hmm. Black women. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about those two identities? Yeah, for Lena Horne, of course, she was thought of as being this beautiful sex symbol. She was also an incredibly talented woman. I don't, I don't think that scholars sometimes give her the due that she deserves, really, for um, her ability to sing and to dance. And she was very generous. Any, I, I love having conversations about her because there are people who remember having some sort of connection with her. Either, either they saw her and they felt like she made eye contact and she made space for them uh, as Black people in a predominantly white setting. Or um, someone told me about her uncle who had a photo um, and they think the family, so the family story is that she was in relationship with this uncle because, because of the way that she signed it, you know, who knows, but, um, so publicly for Black people in particular, she was a gem, she was, she had her connections to the NAACP, but in some ways she did struggle privately about how certain decisions that she would make, for example, marrying a white man, how that might um, offend her her black um, audience and and fans because she really loved black people, and that was one thing that I enjoyed writing about is how these women she married him anyway, so how they were willing to pursue the pleasure that they wanted in their private lives and to deal with any consequences that may have come and they, they didn't come, black people still love her. So, <laughs> <laughs> but she was willing to take the chance on love. Um, and you talk a bit about the concept of voyeurism, um, mm -hmm. specifically uh, how, how men, how black men are interpreting the identities of black women. Um, and you bring up Lance, uh, Langston Hughes as an mm -hmm. example. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, Langston Hughes was the greatest voyeur, I think, of, of Black life. And that was the way in which he was able to capture Black life and, and the beauty that he saw in his own writing and his poetry when he writes about Black women in his fiction, Not Without Laughter, a novel that I could write 10 more chapters about. It's so, such a complicated um, book, but it is also written in homage to a particular blues woman and he loved the blues. And when black women are on stages, when 
Black people know what it's like to be surveilled. So I wondered what it would mean in light of the politics of respectability to think about the pressures of being um, seen through the lens of voyeurs, people who were paying to maybe see a certain kind of performance and that performance can be just a social everyday performance or it can be a professional performance by someone who's on a stage who chooses to be there. But there are still pressures attached to that. So how does one make a life when they are the subject of um, the voyeuristic lens. And, th and that was what I was interested in in, um, in exploring in my work. And one of the things I really loved about See Me Naked was the, the final chapter, the way you, you ended it. You, you have all of these wonderful studies um, of, of women uh, to make your scholarly thesis an argument. And then you end with your final chapter on a very personal note, describing mm -hmm. your own pleasures mm -hmm. um, and how that could be articulated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your choice to end your, your book in that fashion? Well, it's just like I tell my graduate students, it's okay to include yourself in some way, even if it's a small way. So usually I, I may open with a paragraph or something um, that places me in the work as a writer because I'm there anyway. Um, but in that particular one, I wanted to, and I, and I, and I play with the pronouns of I and me and they in the introduction. So, so I do start that early, but I was writing, finishing that book at a particular time. And I could not write and pretend as though I was not writing during a pandemic. <laughs> and so um, I thought it important so I'm talking about movement a lot. There's, there's me walking through the neighborhood and making a choice not to walk at the park anymore, but I'm writing that thinking about Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm writing that um, as a metaphor for my own journey as a woman at a particular time um, in, my, in my own life. And so um, there's so much there. So that's my own story, but I'm also aware of the voyeur. So um, physically as I walk through the neighborhood, but also the reader. So for me, it, it was probably the most difficult part of the book to write because I'm writing about myself, my own experience, my own story. It really tied the story together. I, I thought it was a wonderful way to end the book. Um, to make certain we have enough time for people to be able to ask questions, I wanted to end on this question. What do you consider to be the most critical element to elevating Black voices in academic scholarship presently? And what can we do um, in libraries and archives to help that? Well, first of all, I, I would certainly say to continue what you all are doing, but um, which is, is to be open and receptive to people knocking on the door with these crazy ideas in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> what about the stuff on Elm Street? So, um, so I think that that's the first step because if, if you're not willing to do that, then there's really no point. But certainly I know that the library and we continue to have these conversations around diversity. And so um, having diverse people who are part of the unit. So there are so many other voices that can be included in the library's archives, particularly as, as we have these movements taking place in the world and so many people are settling in our area. Um, how do we tap into these new communities? But I also think that continuing 
the work of, um, so there's one black church, but there are many black churches that are over a hundred years old, right? Um, there are many activists who are in the city. Um, and, and of course we have some ongoing projects that, that we are hoping to bring into the fold as well. So continuing to do the work is always a process. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. And I am going to open up chat to questions. Please give a round of applause, virtual applause to Dr. Green. Thank you. So first question in chat, how did Alice Dunbar Nelson understand her own sexuality, especially as a black woman? Well, she, like I said, she, she had relationships with women. I think that for her, like for many people, understanding who she was as a woman was a process. So for example, she had to make this decisions about what kind of husband she was going to have. She had to make decisions about the relationships that she had with, with uh, women, knowing that those relationships weren't necessarily going to lead to marriage because, um, or, or any form of marriage. People certainly did same-sex um, couples coupled during that time, but she was married um, when two of the relationships happened and it was between marriages when another relationship happened. So I think that she had to just sort of um, build relationships on conveniences. Um, which becomes really important when people are, are doing something that they don't want other people to know. So um, letters become important, but what about the intimacy? And so traveling or being around the corner from one lover or, or traveling and being out of the sight of other people was important to her as well so it, it you know it, it it took a lot of navigation for <laughs> physically and otherwise for her to be able to be the woman that she was do we have any other questions while we're waiting to see if anyone's formulating in chat i do want to ask um, the Alice Dunbar Nelson diaries, they're at, in Delaware, correct? Yeah, there's, um, it's actually next to me. Um, so Gloria Hull, Gloria Kasha Hull uh, did the early recovery work because she had access to the archive. Um, shout out to her niece, um, Pauline Moore who was a librarian. And when her aunt died, she inherited all of this material that her aunt had. And so Gloria Hall, who was an English professor, went to her house and saw all of this material and was able to publish some things about her. And one of them is a diary that has excerpts from the diary. That is no longer in print, even though I have um, two copies of it. And she was able to publish with Oxford Press some short stories, her, her journalism, um, you know, but there's so much that hasn't been published. But yes, most of her work is housed at the University of Delaware's archives. What was it like having your hands on that original material? I, when I went up there with that one question, I did not know that I was going to end up writing a biography, but when they pulled out the boxes that I asked for, and it may have been just one file that I asked for, but you know, nobody brings that one file, they bring the box. And so when I saw that material 
one of the librarians asked me, so what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, which was a lie. I knew that I was going to have to write a biography about her. And it took me 10 years to finish it. So in chat, we have a question, but um, what is next for you in terms of your research? Is there a project you are just beginning or something you want to do a deeper dive about? Yeah, I am doing more work on Yolanda Du Bois, the, the only surviving child of W.E.B. Du Bois. People tend to look at Du Bois um, and not really talk about him as a father, but he had a complicated relationship with his daughter. So I am interested in knowing much more about her and that relationship. And that does come out of the chapter that I have on Yolanda Du Bois in See Me Naked. Right, people, people can't wait. We're, you've published two books this year, we want the next. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any other questions for Dr. Green? Oh, I do want to bring up, um, okay, uh, next question. This will be our final question, I think. While working on See Me Naked, was there a particular experience that resonated the most with your personal life? I, um, so working on um, or listening to Moms Mabley gave me pleasure um, because if, if anybody has listened to even a little bit of Moms Mabley, then you know that she was quite talented and how she told stories that made people laugh. <laughs> And it was fascinating to hear her because she gets better over the years, but she also gets more popular as she gets older. So um, first of all, the fact that she was able to carry on a career for as long as she did, um, standing up and talking, um, you know, and it, that, that takes a lot of, of stamina to be able to do that. But, um, but she was just so funny and I can, can remember distinctly going to my mother's house over the Christmas break, and, and she still lives in the New Orleans area. And she heard me in my room laughing because I was listening to uh, Mom's Mabel, and, she, and so she sticks her head in to see what in the world I'm laughing at. And she listens for a while and she says, you and my sister would have enjoyed that so much. And her sister, her older sister had passed away um, several months before that. So, um, so I, I, every time I think about mom's little baby, I get, I'm getting teary eyed now, but I think about my aunt who loved to laugh. <laughs> she, she was um, quite funny in her own right. We have people at, adding Moms Mabelie to their playlist right now based on yes, your recommendation. Please do, please do. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you for speaking with us today. We are so fortunate to be working with you here at UNCG. And thank you so much for um, sharing your life about being an educator, researcher, and your latest books. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Well, thank you, Stacy, and thanks to all of you all who attended. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.